Welcome to the uh, Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at New York University. My name is Robert Boynton. I run the literary reportage concentration here. And I'm very glad to welcome Suki Kim to our conversation tonight. Suki Kim was born in South Korea and came to the United States when she was 13. She has a BA from Barnard and studied at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. She has held Fulbright and Guggenheim fellowships and is the author of the 2003 novel, The Interpreter, which, was, which won the Penn Beyond Margins Award and the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award. She first reported from North Korea in 2002 on the occasion of Kim Jong-il's birthday. In 2008, she covered the New York Philharmonic's Pyongyang performance for Harper's Magazine, and she wrote about defectors for, uh, on the North Korean-Chinese border, also for Harper's, in uh, 2010. Since its release in mid-October, Without You, There Is No Us, My Time with the Sons of North Korea's Elite, has received starred reviews from Publishers Weekly, Booklist, Library Journal, and great reviews from Foreign Policy, Minneapolis Star Review, uh, Tribune, uh, Oprah, Vogue. It was featured on NPR's Diane Rehm show and on Morning Edition, and it has been excerpted in Harper's and the New York Times Magazine. The book has so far been sold to seven countries and will be released in the UK and South Korea in 2015. Uh, we're going to start tonight with a uh, reading. Uh, Suki's going to read from the prologue to her book. So welcome, Suki Kim. Hi. So, um, hi. So I'm just going to read the, I don't know how many of you read the book, but I'm just going to read the prologue. And then we'll talk about the book and then open the floor for questions. So, time there seemed to pass differently. When you are shut off from the world, every day is exactly the same as the one before. This sameness has a way of wearing down your soul until you become nothing but a breathing, toiling, consuming thing that awakes to the sun and sleeps at the dawning of the dark. The emptiness runs deep, deeper with each slowing day and you become increasingly invisible and inconsequential. That's how I felt at times, a tiny insect circling itself only to continue and continue. There in that relentless vacuum, nothing moved. No news came in or out, no phone calls to or from anyone, no emails, no letters, no ideas not prescribed by the regime, 30 missionaries disguised as teachers and 270 male North Korean students and me, the sole writer disguised as a missionary, disguised as a teacher. Locked in that prison, disguised as a campus in an empty Pyongyang suburb, heavily guarded around the clock, all we had was one another. So that's the prologue. So Sugi, this was actually the book was your, this was your third time, as I count it, in North Korea. You were there in 2008, and then uh, you were also there for, I'm sorry, 2002, and then 2008. Um, it was actually my fifth visit. Your fifth visit, okay. Yeah. How did you, how did, well, tell me about the other visits, and how did you get in this time? Um, I went the first time for the 60th uh, birthday celebration of Kim Jong-il by joining a pro Kim Jong-il um, organization, like a lawyer list for Kim Jong-il uh, organization. And then I was chosen as the, um, which I didn't know at the time, but as a youth delegate to hail the great leader. <laughs> and um, so it ended up being kind of undercover, but all, like not on purpose. So I went in like that the first time and I got to really experience it as a VIP. Um, I, you know, I didn't stay at a hotel, I stayed at a VIP quarter and did all the state events um, of Kim Jong-il's birthday celebration. Then I went back for a, a 
Philharmonic coverage, and of course the city looked completely different because 100 journalists came in to cover North Korea. So it's a little bit like Cinderella, <laughs> you know, like, you know, the, it's like when other people come, everything changes, the lights are up, and it just looks so different. And um, then I went in in 2009 for, because uh, I was starting to pursue this school. So I went in 2009 to check out the school um, place. And then I went in again in 2010 and 2011, twice. And um, maybe you could describe Proust and describe the circumstances there and what you went into, what you signed up for. Uh, I just, you know, it was uh, during the Philharmonic coverage that I found out that this odd thing, I mean, I, uh, the school was being built. I didn't, it seems so unfathomable. There was this school, the school didn't exist yet in 2008, because it opened by the end of 2010. Um, but actually I met, you know, Philharmonic trip was an odd one, because I don't know how many of you remember. All we saw was there was this concert in Pyongyang by New York Philharmonic, but there was a lot of backstory. And there was, you know, uh, funders who put in a lot of money for that concert to happen, so there were these, incredibly rich people who funded it. So, because North Korea didn't put in a penny for that, obviously. So, um, I was told by one of the richest people in the world's, um, I guess, wife, that the school was being set up. Like, she, you know, knew about it. So, immediately I asked her to refer me to the founder of the school, so I applied for a job. I just thought if a school's been built, I might as well teach there. <laughs> uh, and maybe you could describe a bit of, about the school. It's certainly, uh, I too had the same reaction about uh, the idea of a missionary school there, the idea of any school set up by outsiders there was so odd. Uh, what were the parameters of the school? What was the purpose of the school? H how did the school describe itself? And, and then we'll talk about how, how you describe it. Well, you know, oddly enough, they never described it as a Christian uh, missionary project. They just said, a school is being built in Pyongyang, in a suburb, and all the teaching staff will be foreigners. That's all I knew. And I went, I submitted my resume, and I went through, like I got recommendation letters. It was just like any other job. But then I got an interview, and they still didn't say anything about it being Christian. It's not Christian, it's actually a fundamental missionary, so that's different. Um, so I just thought of it as just this, this somehow, I, what I imagined was that this was a propaganda tool for the North Korean government to set up a school that looks really good on, on surface so that they can, you know, invite reporters in. That is since what happened, you know, like, BBC will go in there for three days and then come out with a photo of a very good-looking school and good-looking students so that we can pretend it's an NYU, <laughs> which it's, you know, in Pyongyang. <laughs> and it doesn't, it kind of looks like NYU in Pyongyang, basically, except, you know, once you're in there for longer than three days, you realize it is North Korea. I mean, it wouldn't be that unusual. I mean, the North has set up churches in Pyongyang to show that there is freedom of religion these are sort of these Potemkin churches, as it were. So the idea of a Potemkin free university or a free thinking university is not, uh, not all that strange, really. Uh, no, it's not. There's a lot of like, like um, it's just a, such a strange concept, but there are a lot of things like, you know, there's an election booth in Pyongyang, an election day. But, I mean, we know there is no election there. So it is kind of like theater aspect to it. So, so uh, okay, so there's, there's this, uh, this institution, Pust, uh, where um, you are teaching, there's no mention, no discussion about uh, there being a particular fundamentalist or Christian uh, 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 you know, curriculum. Uh, what, what, who were your students and what were they like? So my students, I didn't know either. You know, because, you know, the thing about anything that has to do with the North Korea project, they're not really going to explain to you what's going on. 
And you also don't ask a lot of questions because if, if you ask a lot of questions, they might kind of not want you there. So I think I just kind of didn't ask. That's a part of why a lot of it ends up unfolding like a mystery. And then um, I found out when I got there in 2011 is when I went in, in July. And I found that all the other universities in North Korea were shut. Like they had closed every university in that whole country and sent the university students to a construction field. And only this school was in existence, which was such a weird phenomenon. And what that meant was these, there were 270 of them, now there are more. The school's still in existence that these students were the creme de la creme of North Korea. They were the sons of the elite. Everybody else is in construction field. Every 20-year-old who are university students of North Korea were in construction field in 2011, except these 270 young men. And this was, they were doing construction because this was the lead up to the 100th anniversary of the birth of Kim Il-sung. This was the great centennial year, and they were trying to get all the various building projects done and all the other sorts of things complete. Is that, is that right? Well, that was an official reason. I mean, it's really interesting why all, I mean, let's think about it, let's think about it. It's really an interesting year if you send every 20-year-old to a construction field. So that year happened to be Juche year 100. So North Korea counts their calendar from the birth of the original great leader. So it's kind of like, I guess the birth of Jesus comes like a, I don't know, the, the calendar system. So calendar system there is based on the, the Kim, Jong, Kim Il Sung's birth. So that was year, not 2011, but it was actually year 100. So this was an important year, and they sent all the um, they sent all the students into construction fields, saying they're going to build a powerful and prosperous nation, which is one of North Korea's slogans. However, we also know by the end of 2011, Kim, Kim Jong Il died. So, you know, in and I have that in the book. You know, it felt like something was in the works. Something big is going to happen in this country because it's as if they're waiting for the regime change to come. That is the year Kim, Kim Jong-il was rumored to be six in 2008. And it's as if they didn't, some, they expected some political turmoil to happen. And they were, they kind of put these future leaders of North Korea in a hiding place to wait out the political storm. I mean, it's really a, a spectacular idea when you think about it. So uh, one, one thing that I was surprised by in the, in the book is that you, know, you, a Korean speaker, were forbidden from speaking in Korean to your Korean-speaking students. You communicated solely, except for a very interesting passage towards the end, you communicated solely in English. Uh, why was that? Well, because I was their English teacher, and also the system did not want me to get close to them. So, you know, it's kind of a win-win situation. <laughs> um, however, you know, human beings are not robots. So although you're not allowed to speak it, you kind of slip a little bit. You know, or they're hearing me. There were minders everywhere. 24-7, there were minders. Those minders spoke Korean with me. So the kids would hear me speak Korean, and then I would hear them speak Korean with each other. And then so we would laugh at the same jokes, but except we weren't, we couldn't talk. It's a little like, it's a little bizarre. <laughs> like Romeo and Juliet or something, you know, like, where you're just not allowed to basically communicate in your language. And you start, you know, when you actually really stop people from communicating like that, you kind of get closer. That's just the human nature. So I feel like we really bonded a little bit because we couldn't communicate, <laughs> although we knew that we would much rather speak Korean to each other. There was that very, very moving uh, 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 time towards the end of your time there where your students asked whether you could speak to them in Korean. It is the only request my students made of me the entire time I was there. I was there through the six months of Kim Jong-il's last, um, you know, his final year. Because I, I was there when Kim Jong-il died. And my students never asked me. We got very, very, very close, more and more as the time passed. 
and they never asked me anything. And my last day, I asked them, do you have any request or question? Is there anything you want? And they said, teacher, could you please speak to us in Korean? And it was such a, a moment where, you know, I'm their English teacher, the only thing they wanted me to do was speak to them in Korean. And I felt like they wanted a sort of a bond that went beyond something. <laughs> And it really, I mean, I broke down, you know, because, and I wasn't allowed to. So I broke the rule, and they broke the rule, in a way. It was their final moment together. It was me talking to them in Korean, and I thanked them. And Koreans bow when you thank each other. So I thanked them, and I bowed to them for um, letting me be their teacher. And I did say to them that I, which I never did in English, but in Korean, I did tell them that I, I um, really love them and will think about them always. That came through, the, your love for them and your real uh, connection with them came through the book over and over again. Uh, I, I mean, it's so, so interesting, I mean, you know, to people who don't understand enough about the dynamics of reporting on North Korea, the, the regime is incredibly smart about the limitations they place on reporters and just about anybody else. And then they also very smart about managing the time that anyone does spend there. So very few reporters get to be there for more than five days or so. Uh, and you've had this extraordinary experience. You've had been there far longer than anyone I know, and certainly in continuous amount of time. Um, I guess what I was wondering is, you know, you've had a an inside view, not so much of the country, although you did, but you were very limited, but you've had an inside view of something even more valuable of the next generation of leadership, should the regime survive. And how did you, what did you take away from your intimate sort of experience with these students and your real love for them and your thoughts about what kind of leaders they would be and what kind of future they could envision for North Korea? You know, I think that was a really um, upsetting, I mean, more than upsetting thing about being there is that, you know, there are two separate things, which is the people and also the system. And people, they're just like other college kids. You know, they giggle about girls all the time and, and just adorable. And also because they're so sheltered, they didn't even know what the internet was. So, and they're the Pyongyang Uni University you know, post this Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. If they don't know the existence of internet and their majors are computer, then it's really like they have no idea. They had no idea about so basically anything. And um, but th what that also meant was that they were so innocent on some level and like pure. <laughs> you know, they really like they would just all get up when I get into a classroom. <laughs> As a teacher, you just never see a college student who all blush when they have to talk to you and just bow all the time, so obedient. And this quality was, on some level, very, very disturbing. Another level, quite, it's the thing that I feel like we lose a lot somehow is the respect <laughs> and, you know, listening. And there was that to them that I found unbelievably lovable and yet disturbing. But their system was, it's, you know, when they say it's the one most, um, you know, it's the, it's the biggest violations against humanity in North Korea is unsurpassed, the level of violations. And that is what you have there. And you feel that on a daily basis. There was absolutely no freedom, none whatsoever. And, you know, it, I mean, what kind of leaders could they be? I mean, it all depends on their system. And their system is, I mean, beyond anything, there is just zero, zero, zero freedom for one second of their lives. And these were the sons of elite. Did you find that they had, I mean, you were often, there, there's wonderful passages where you're asking them to write different kinds of essays and sort of really thoughtful questions. And, and part of me was thinking that you were asking them to uh, explore parts of themselves uh, for their own sort of salvation in some ways. Did you find there was anything that they particularly were either good, especially good at writing about or especially bad at writing about? Well, it's not, there's no other thing but the great leader. So it's like great leader, great leader, great leader. 
There's just literally nothing else. Um, the whole essay writing thing, you know, because teaching there meant that you had to get everything approved. So, and there was a group of people called counterparts, and you just they had to approve anything you taught. Um, so I somehow got essay writing approved because it was an English writing class, reading and writing. That's what I taught. So it wasn't. I mean, I had to teach writing. <laughs> and that does start from writing a paragraph and essays. But when you think about it, I didn't think about it literally up until when I tried to explain it to them. What is an essay? Essay, three paragraph essays, what? A thesis sentence, introduction, a body paragraph full of proofs, and then conclusion. You know, you do have to prove your thesis. That's the whole point of an essay. And they could not grasp it. It was like impossible to try to teach that. They could not grasp an introduction, what that meant, because the great leader doesn't require introduction. Proof, well, it just went nowhere. No matter, just concept-wise, they could, conclusion also doesn't exist there. It's all the same pace. And trying to get them to come up with a thesis was an impossible thing. So we spent all this time trying to get them to understand how to, and I realized what I was trying to teach through essay. And I didn't realize like that that's what my teachers taught me when I learned writing essays for the first time, that it's about critical thinking, which they didn't, they're not allowed to have that thinking in, in North Korea. So I think I found that experience to be really alarming. And I mean, one of the critical moments in the book is when they really, um, one student did say to me, because every day they had to go write, you know, every day also there, all the students had to go take classes in Juche. Juche is North Korea's foundational philosophy, self-reliance. And the North Korean, they always write Juche compositions in every single day. They write these compositions about the great leader. And he said to me, wow, like it was weird because he realized those Juche compositions are also essays. But then he, I guess he started thinking, he said, you know, I looked at it as an essay. So what, what does that mean? You're looking at an introduction, you know, body paragraph ev with evidence, thesis sentence, conclusion. And he said, you know, once I thought it was an essay, it felt really weird. And my heart sank because I realized what that meant was he was now beginning to question his system. And those were moments that I found very troubling of who they are, but also troubling for my own motive for being there. Because, like, what's he going to do if he starts questioning his system? He's stuck in North Korea. So if I want him to be safe, this was not exactly the right kind of a lesson. So, I mean, it's, it's very, uh, com I think the complexity of that is that if he starts questioning his system, then that's the whole purpose, right? Open that world up. But... What's going to happen to them? And you go through, I mean, you really explore that thought and that, that dilemma uh, beautifully because you, you know, you're very kind about not wanting to lord over them their ignorance of, say, the internet or something else or this idea, and I think this is, is something that really struck me, is that, you know, there's so many Westerners who will be so condescending towards the North and you are very, we're very, very humane about not wanting to make them feel that they were lacking something, knowing that in the currency of their society to be told that the outside world had something that was vastly superior to what they had was, was would it be painful for them. Uh, they, you, you were very good at packaging a lot of what you told them. But I was wondering about this other thing you came up with that you really discovered about them that was sort of disturbing was that they lie all the time, and they lied to you they constantly. They lied all the time. Talk about that. And why, why do they lie all the time? All what do the they time. lie about? Everything, everything. <laughs> it was really, it was really um, disturbing. So I didn't know in the beginning. But they would just lie. They would say, like, oh, I should have cheated better. You know, I cheated in that, that game that we played, and I really wish I cheated better than I would have won. Or like, I mean, I guess that is telling the truth. <laughs> I was admitting that cheating is fine. But they would also just lie. They would just, you know, they, they would say, oh, you know, I, um, I, my, you know, they wouldn't, they, we all shared a meal, every meal. Three students and me in a cafeteria. 
And then if a student is missing, they would say, oh, he's, I'm like, we're, you know, basically it was assigned seating. Sometimes it's voluntary, a lot of times we would just, because the counterpart, North Korean staff wouldn't let us sit with the same students again and again in case we get closer. So we had to just sort of rotate who sits with me every meal. So then like sometimes the students were changed. So, so where is that student? And they're like, and they're like immediately, you know, no hesitation. One would be like, oh, he's, he's getting a haircut. And another's like, oh, he's, he has a stomach ache. So I would be like, wait, 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 is he getting a stomach? Is he have a, does he have a stomach ache or does he have a haircut? It's like, oh, he had a stomach ache, then went to get a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> and it would just happen so quickly, the explanation, that I, you know, it just took a while. And I think it just, and then I, I think the longer I was there, I realized that some lies they just told all the time. They'll say things like, oh, I talk to my mother every day. And, you know, they weren't allowed to keep, they were never allowed out of this locked compound. They never could keep in touch with home. But they just had to say it, I think, to cover up their system. But sometimes some other lies were just habit. Because I think, like, they just, it just wasn't such a big deal in some way. So it was kind of confusing to, dis, dis, like, differentiate the, the different lies. But then the really... Uh, difficult thing about being there was, but I, you know, the longer I spent time with them, I could see when they lied out of habit, when they lied out of fear. And then also, then I realized everything is a lie. The great leader stuff is a lie. You know, they all told me that basketball makes a human being grow taller because they've been taught that. They all told me that their scientists had changed the blood type from A to B and had been hailed as the greatest discovery in the universe. And I was like, that's just not true. <laughs> but that's what they've been taught. So, you know, I mean, they've just been told lies all the time. But the missionaries were also lying, you know, because they were pretending not to be missionaries because they were not allowed to proselytize. And then I guess I was lying because I was an undercover journalist. So there was this sense of really so many levels of lies there. And did you ever, I mean, as I recall in the book, you were very careful again, as I was saying, not to call them on things. Did you ever call them on their lies? Did you ever point out that, I mean, for instance, the most obvious ones were uh, they would say, oh, uh, we slept late this morning and you had, would have seen them doing exercises outside in the courtyard. I, like I just saw them and they would say, oh, actually, I saw them working and stuff. And they'll say, I slept late. So it's this kind of lie where it just doesn't, you know, it's like, why would you even lie? Because I, I saw you, you out the window. Did you ever at that point say in a nice way. No, I don't think, I think I learned at some point not, I mean, first of all, everyone was watching everyone. So if you're talking, I never talk to them without, if I'm talking, also they all traveled together. So there was a sort of a bit of body system, which I thought was best friends. But after a while, I realized one person was always responsive for another person. So they never talked to me alone. But it's also a watching system because they report on each other. So you just never say something that's going to get somebody in trouble. And also some things I remember, I mean, there were so many of these incidences which are all in the book, but one person, one student said, well, actually, I think a few told me that. They said, the Olympic in Atlanta, the official Olympic food was kimchi. <laughs> because kimchi is the best food in the world. And I was like, I do not think kimchi was the official Olympic food <laughs> of the Olympic in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> they said, yes, it is. Their textbook says that. And then I really, you know, because they would say this in their essay, and I was going to, you know, I was going to, like, mark it, because they kept, I was like, no, no, you know, prove it. But then I thought, and then another teacher said, if their textbook says that, you can't say that's a lie. So, I mean, I can't, well, who am I to say it's a lie? Their textbook says it, and then there's this, like, Suki Kim says, actually, it's not true. <laughs> well, I, I know a lot of Koreans who believe that kimchi is the best food I mean, in the world. I mean, I think so it's the best not... food in the world, but, I mean, <laughs> exactly. that's not, I don't know. <laughs> it's certainly not the official Olympic food. <laughs> no, not, not yet. Not yet. It, it, may, it may well be at some point. Um, the, the, your, your, what was life for you like at Pust? You, you, you describe being quite lonely, you had this relationship in 
Brooklyn you're able to sort of communicate with via email in some sort of a stilted way, but what was the lived experience? You sound like you were very shut off uh, during that six months. Oh, it was miserable, absolutely miserable. Um, I, think the, I think someone actually commented that. The book is really, they, I mean, they build it as a memoir, and it's really personal. And one of the reasons we're doing that was because my whole goal was writing this book was to humanize North Korea. North Koreans and North Korea, so that you begin to, that it's not just like, you know, some label of like nuclear story or defector story, you know, it's actually like people's story. So what that meant was I also had to be humanized. You know, I'm not a journalist looking at my subject, so I became a person, Suki, living with these young men. So, you know, it's almost like really like a diary. So I'm crying a lot, and it's really, really bleak. And also I was with missionaries, like serious missionaries, and it was just so lonely on so many levels, but also um, you're just never alone, because minders are watching you all the time, they bug everything, everywhere is bugged, the campus was designed in the way everywhere you can see everyone, it's almost like a circle. And there were these road walkways that had windows on both sides. So even if you walk around in those walkways, you can be seen. And they can, so there was this really sense of absolutely nowhere you can go. But even in your room, I was told that basically just don't say stuff because it could be, you know, somebody's watching. And I think this sense of never being alone was maddening at some point. And also, like, you know, you don't, when you're talking to the students, and you're never allowed out also physically. I mean, we went on an outing to stores with a minder guided bus trip. I mean, those were dreadful too. And then we went on this minder guided sightseeing tour. But even the sightseeing tour, it didn't matter where you went. You would go to an apple, they would take you to an apple farm. But the apple farm wasn't really about apple farm. It was because it was the great leader's 11th wonder of the nation. So they would talk about how the great leader hailed this apple as the best apple that he's ever had. And the great leader stood right here saying these words about this. I mean, it was like it literally had nothing to do with the apple farm. It was about the great leader. So I think like this relentless deja vu, it's not even deja vu, it's like that great groundhog day kind of, you know, it's like, you're just playing re replay over and over and over. And I think that's what makes the loneliness deeper. It was really, and they were never allowed out. I mean, so it's this, <laughs> it's really a start, it's that deja vu feeling. Like, I did this yesterday, and I did this yesterday. And then another thing that drove me, I think, mad was because I was always circling my, what I might have said. Because if you're having a meal, or the classroom was also recorded, so anything you might have slipped in your speech could get not you in trouble, but also the students in trouble. So every meal afterward, I would have to replay in my mind. Like, did I say something? Was that something that should have that they could have reported to the you know power, and then I could get? So I think this replay. Hitting a replay is a very difficult one. W were there ever any repercussions? I mean, was there anything you ever said that was clearly had reverberations beyond you? I think, you know, in my own way, I tried to be clever, which I wasn't allowed to be. One of the rules, they gave me these pages and pages. The thing that Har Harper's excerpted was the rules, what, what I was allowed to do there was very little. I wasn't allowed to do anything. Like I wasn't allowed to talk about the outside world. I wasn't allowed to wear jeans because Kim Jong Il doesn't like jeans. I wasn't allowed to um, say like, oh, it's like that over there. In our, you know, it's like the, the food here is nice, but the food back home, like you never do that. Um, so I think because there was so little that I was allowed to do. What was the question? <laughs> were there ever? Did you ever break a rule, and were there repercussions? Did you have a sense that someone had listened or heard, and that someone was getting in trouble, or that you were being reprimanded, or anything like that? I think that I, I personally wasn't. I think this uh, one of the missionaries was. Um, oh, oh! I know. One time they, it, you know, repercussion was not if you proselytize like give a Bible, I think one of the teachers got sent back for that. Um, my repercussion was very subtly done. Like 
I tried to be clever with my lessons. I included, because they didn't know who Steve Jobs was. And Steve Jobs died when I was there. Because I had the CNN Asia in my room. The students had, like, the North Korean channel only. So they did, we had a, even in our faculty dormitory, we were, I mean, the teacher dormitory had the CNN Asia kids. The students dormitory only had, you know, Joseon Jungang, the central TV. So when Steve Jobs died, I tried to drop Steve Jobs a little bit, but they didn't know, but they were computer majors. So I, I, I found these essays, because the theme, we always had a theme every lesson. It was about education. So I, I added these articles I found that mentioned Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. And I thought this might make them, because especially Mark Zuckerberg was a college dropout, right? So I was like, so it was like the article that mentioned he was at Harvard and dropped out. So I thought they might be interested. He became like the youngest billionaire of the world. He invented Facebook. I mean, that would have meant Facebook would have meant nothing to them. But I thought they might like this. But then they said nothing in the classroom, like nothing, no response. And then like the next lesson, because they were all writing an essay right at the time, they all wanted to change the topic of their essay. And suddenly it became all about how evil America is. And suddenly the topic became like gun controls evil, divorce is evil, um, fast food is, I'm some of which I agree, like fast food is evil, they said. Well, they said, they said McDonald's is evil was a theme that they, one of them decided. And then he was like, so what kind of food does McDonald's make? So he didn't know, like, he, all, but I felt like suddenly everybody changed their topic, meant the power that be, which is the counterpart North Korean staff, talk to them. They had some meeting, and they didn't like the Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg stuff. They were like, you know, and so that kind of repercussion happened. Like, be careful. That was like basically telling me, be careful. Now, you, you were under you know, surveillance uh, of one form or another all the time. How did you manage to take notes, take the level of detailed notes that you, were, that you took in order to later on write this book? Well, I, I wrote um, every, like at dawn, and then I wrote when I got back all the notes, and I also carried my laptop with me wherever I went. Because I was a teacher, I could open the laptop and taking notes, but I was actually just taking my notes. But Generally, I also, the real document, I um, had it on USB and had it on my body the whole time, and then I ra erased it from the laptop in case they look into my laptop. So these little USB sticks that I had on me, I felt like, oh my god, I'm just going to lose them one day, <laughs> and that'll be it. <laughs> you wear them as jewelry or something like that? Yeah, I had like, like this kind of necklace, but it was USB sticks like at the end. And then, you know, like I just, I just had them, like in a key ring I had it, because I had, I had several. And, and then I would like actually leave one in a room, but like in a garbage can and stuff. And then, so I had several. But on my computer, it was always erased. Now, you, you talked about how this was a, uh, a personal book, a memoir of sorts, and uh, the, the personal dimension is both the experience you had there, but it's also one that really goes back generationally about your family and the phenomenon of divided Koreans, which is such a painful and present issue in Korea today. Can you talk a bit about, about, about what you wrote about your divided family and tell us a bit about that and how that played out in this context? I think that's, I mean, in a way I kind of, um, I don't, I really think of this book as more about the division. This is what happened when Korea got divided artificially. And on both sides of my family, um, people, members of family got lost during the war to North Korea. And so we, on both sides of my family, experienced terrible loss of family members just never being re reunited. And I think that tragedy that I grew up in, literally I was told over and over and over, you know, my mother's side is the uncle and my dad's side is the... I mean, my, my mom's brother and my dad's side, uh, my mom's, co my dad's cousins. And I think like, so when you grow up in that loss, it just becomes a part of the, uh, I guess, pain or heartbreak that you just live with. And then, you know, oddly enough, you know, I came here when I was 13 and, and it was a very sudden break 
we fled, and I wanted to be a writer, <laughs> and even as when I was little, and then I lost the language, and, and home, and the country. So I felt like I really felt, yet again, what it means to, you know, my grandmother who longed to see her son until her dying day. I, I kind of could tap into that loss somewhere, and then I imagined, I think, I'm just a person, and I didn't even go through the war. And my grandmother's entire rest of life was longing to see her son on the other side of the border. And, and I felt like from 13, I just missed Korea all the time. I just wanted to go home. And America was so foreign to me and alien, and this language was alien. So I think like I'm just one person, but there's supposedly a million plus families who experienced this. And why? Because Korea, which was a 5,000-year-old kingdom, got just caught up one day. I mean, the origin of Korean division is going back to 1945, when the Allies come, and when they liberated the Korea from Japanese colonialization, they just drew this line. It was actually the United States that drew that line. And, and there we go. People just, you know, and then the war happens. Suddenly, the kingdom is divided into two, and you have the Russian, you know, hand-picked Kim Il-sung, who ended up being the original great leader. And then in the South, we had Lee Seung-man, who was the South Korean president, who was educated in the United States. So it's really South and North Korea was never a civil war. So I think that understanding, you know, I kind of wanted to just tell that story. Here we are in 2014. We have a generation, when they talk about the Korean division, this reuniting families, you know, you have million plus families who just never saw each other, like my grandmother, and that generation all died. Just, and, and it's not that complicated. It's just like missing a son, missing a, you know, literally like your husband or, or a child. And I think it's just this generation died missing somebody. And I felt like that's very traumatic. And what you have today is North Korea, which is a crazy nation. And then you have South Korea, the world's 13th richest country, practically the United States. When you go there, I don't know how many of you have been to Seoul, South Korea. I mean, it's like, it's like New York. And I think it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's really alarming, you know, the repercussion of, I think, human cruelty when they cut up a nation without thinking of the human price, sacrifice. I mean, I think that's what I wanted to write this book. Now, so you, you said that the, the, one, the one you benefited from Kim Jong-il's death and that it gave you an ending. It gave you a sense of closure. Uh, it gave you a literary ending anyway. Do, do you have any thoughts about, about North Korea beyond Kim Jong-il? Now, I mean, as I was, <clears throat> excuse me, as I was reading the book and looking at pictures of Kim Jong-un, I thought, you know, this guy is only five or eight years older than some of your students. And, you know, he's certainly the son of an elite. Uh, the, he's not all that different than some of the students you have. Do you have any thoughts about what might happen uh, under Kim Jong-un and, and uh, what, uh, what, what the future of North Korea holds? You know, the really sad thing about North Korea is, you know, I, that was my last day in Pyongyang when Kim Jong-il died. And I mean, that's how I start the book. You know, when they said he died, we couldn't say his name because you're just not allowed to. He's like, too, you, you can't say Kim Jong-il in North Korea because too holy. But when they said he died, I really it felt like God died. You know, and I was also with all the missionaries around Christmas time. So it really was like, wait, wait, Christmas, this is about birth. Like, I was really momentarily confused of this death that... And then I, I found out Kim Jong-il actually died. And, of course, it ended up being the final chapter and the beginning of the book because, you know, it, it perfectly now um, captures one era. But I really sincerely found it heartbreaking for my kids because they really were shaken up beyond belief. And, I, I mean, you know what I remember about Kim Jong-il's death was because they were so heartbroken. I mean, I was crying. I wasn't crying for Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il's death, but I was crying for my kids who are now so absolutely sad. Because when you love someone, you are sad when they're sad. And 
And I really hoped in the back of my mind, I knew I was leaving and I would never see them again and I will never see them again. But I was hoping that this meant their world is better, that their world is changing and will be better. But part of me thought, I bet it's not going to change. And that's what we've seen. I mean, what, what has changed? <laughs> you know, he, Kim Jong-un got everyone killed, pretty much. You know, seven people walked alongside Kim Jong-il's coffin at the funeral. Out of those seven, five are missing. One dead, the other rumored to be dead. These are the power wielders of North Korea. Who, you know, all seven have basically been killed, sent to a gulag, or demoted. And one of whom was Kim Jong-il's uncle. So, I, I mean, literally nothing has changed on some level. Some people will claim things have changed, but we're not seeing it. Any questions? Yes. Do you still have family in North Korea and South Korea that you know of? Um, in South Korea, yes. But North Korea, people went missing into North Korea, and I never found them. So, I mean, at this point, I think they probably died. Did you have, the reason why I asked was if you had any concerns about their well-being, being that you were there. Um, the family, because I think they got lost so long ago at this point, that, I mean, there's no, I mean, they were never traced up until now. So I feel like even if suddenly some North Korean organization comes to me and say, we found them, I feel like I wouldn't even believe them. You know, and they're, historically, they've done sort of pe holding people hostage for whatever purpose. So I think... I think our family had actually tried to look for them, and, and the conclusion was that they were dead. What about socially? What, the, the, oh, Sarah, what, what was it like socially? I mean, did, did they have any kind of social life? I mean, they, you could never just hang out with them with what you were right? Yeah, you could never be, uh, you could never ever be alone with a student but also there's just no free time. Every, you know, to the minute was mapped out. So there is no such thing as, I mean, the, even there's, it's almost like a soldier, I think, if you can think about it. There is just no, there's just no way that you would like just hang out. Even if you play sports, you're all doing it in a group. So it's an odd thing to explain in this world where people just go off on their own and talk to each other and stuff, that just did not exist there. Um, you said something about the regime having, not having been changed over the years. Um, and you did mention the seven great figures having gone missing or either dead or just eliminated. Um, a lot of the scholars are expecting the regime to collapse eventually because of um, what they've been doing. They're kind of comparing the current regime as with their arms and legs cut off because those great figures were the ones that were um, trying to find their ways to survive for the entire re regime. But um, so what are some of your thoughts on that? Like, do you think it's possible for them to um, maintain because they're, as I see it, they're more closed than they ever were before at this point. Well, I mean, I think it's, I wish that it would change and collapse, but it's just that we've been predicting it for a long, long time. You know, they went through a famine where a tenth of the population died and we thought it would fall. It didn't fall. And, um, I mean, the problem is, you know, great leader was always a symbol. I mean, there is actually like a group of military, you know, people at top who always ruled North Korea. We just have different characters now. And I think for them, it just, 
I guess, fall of this regime, it's not just because even if Kim Jong-un died, it would not fall, I don't think, because you have people who are really ruling, leading North Korea right now. So unless they all died, or there's some revolution happened in that country, or China and the United States and South Korea were to put some pressure. But if, I don't think that we are seeing that because China doesn't want North Korea to fall apart and have to deal with all these refugees. South Korea doesn't want to feed North Korea. It's already feeding North Korea to, you know, America wants nothing to do with it. <laughs> So I feel like I don't know what, you know, unless there's some movements there, I don't see how this is going to change. Hi. Um, I was in Pyongyang a few months ago, and one of the tour guides, they said um, they have their own, in North Korea, they have their own internet, which is the inter... Intranet. Intranet. Mm -hmm. um, can you briefly describe your interactions with that? And next thing, did the students, um, when I was in Pyongyang, some of the uh, tours they, that we went to school and they said um, the students have a choice of learning Russian, or Japanese, or English, and Chinese. So, did your students like learn any foreign language other than English? Uh, I know that uh, intranet, first of all, is a North Korean version of the intranet. But my students thought that was the internet. An intranet is a downloaded information. So you could go to a site and then put a press, you know, it's like a library information. You know, when you go to a library and then you just go boom and then there's already an information that's downloaded, that's pre-selected, that's intranet. So it has nothing to do with the internet. Um, but that, you know, they think that's what we all use as the internet. And the, um, what was the Pyongyang question? Um, the four languages. Oh, they do, I know my students actually, one did uh, say that he studied Russian. I think I changed that in the book too. No, I think, I think he, did, he did run, you know, their only friends are Russian and Chinese. I'm surprised by Japanese because that I've never heard. And Japan is their, you know, number one enemy along with the United States and South Korea. So I cannot imagine Japanese being taught there. I think the, um, we were allowed to take pictures in the campus for, I guess, you know, these are the pictures they kind of would, wouldn't mind because it just looks happy, <laughs> students look lovely. So they didn't really care about these being taken. We just, the school wanted me to submit all of these so then they can use them like a propaganda. So I think there is like a website, you can go to like Pust, whatever website, and there's a lot of these you'll see where, where kids just look really happy and, and running around. So it was not really a problem. I think I did tell them that just for my, like when I was teaching, I think another teacher was passing and I said I would just like to have it for my keepsake. But I knew I couldn't use them. And the only thing I could use was from the back where they're marching, because you couldn't tell who they are. But I mean, none of these I would, um, I would, I, I mean, because it just shows their faces, so. About, I mean, I did start out as a novelist. I never thought about North Korea as a fictional topic for me because I think it is just too real in my mind. You know, it's almost like autobiography or something because I think I was writing about my pain. And we do that as a novelist. And I certainly did that with in the interpreter 
which um, was my first novel. It was about the murder of parents, you know, <laughs> like literal death. Um, so there was a lot of pain that I was, I think, fictionalized. But I think this particular topic, uh, I don't, I mean, it's almost like, it's just like, I couldn't fictionalize North Korea in any shape or form, which meant that I had to deliver it. And I think that was what I practiced in a way when I wrote those long pieces for Harper's, how to deliver this like as a novelist. And what we novelists can do is to deliver a moment as if the other person was there. You know, the smell of what the room looked like or when they raised their face at the angle of their you know, face turning that way. And I think the vividness of what it felt like to be there, because in reality, I was never allowed out. And they were never allowed out. So we are basically, I'm describing our same campus over and over and over and over again. So there had to be a very, um, and that's where the fiction or talent came in, I think, or instinct came in, is to describe it, deliver it to the audience. So I think it's about the take the, the novelist in me that, that I took was the description constantly. And I think if you do enough description, then the feelings start following, the heartbreak starts following. Do you think there are writers in North Korea? Fiction writers? Oh yeah, they are. I mean, there are a ton of, um, it's just that there's only one, as you can you know, imagine, only one allowed topic, right? So, and also the writers are, you know, you are acknowledged as a writer if you win the great leader medal, or painter, you know, you are acknowledged by the great leader as the, uh, the official painter. So, you know, it's kind of impossible to be creative in, in, in a way that you, we imagine out here. And I think also, I mean, just from me understanding their world, there is just no free time. I mean, these were the elite. I did not think they had five minutes alone. You know, it was so mapped out. <laughs> so they had those juche classes, which, you know, also like Sengwar Chongai, which is this daily, life unity meeting that they have to do every Saturday. All North Koreans have to do it. And that's a critique session. What that means is you critique each other, you report on each other basically. You'll say, they, I said this and I'm sorry I said it, it was maybe against our nation, and then I, I saw him doing it. So you do that every Saturday. And then you also do, you know, like these juche lessons, and you do also other duties. My students had to do every duty, one of which was guarding that building. The great leader building, they guard. They also have a tower of immortality, which is a tower you see in all of North Korea, supposedly, and I certainly saw them in my drives. You see that in Pyongyang, you probably saw that. And that's the tower that says, our great leader is eternally with us. The miniature version of that would be in each school, in each town, and, the, and also the students would have to wash the bottom of that, and the great leader, Tower of Immortality bottom would be designed with a flower of the great leader. Both Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung have their own flowers. So when you think about this level of control, there's nothing that, and so you have to watch that, like wipe it literally, the tower, right? you know, and, and guard the building, and do the, I mean, there's just no free time. <laughs> That is actually, you know, when I, I did an extensive interviews of the defectors, and they would always say that. There were just no time. And I would ask a naive question like, so what did you think of the New York Philharmonic Pyongyang? Even if they saw it on television, it doesn't really matter because the, it has like nothing to do with their lives. It's a little bit like, you know, if you see Academy Award on television, it's not, it's like, what, like how does that, it's not like I'm gonna go there <laughs> or wear those dresses. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's a little as like, far-fetched as that, I think, because their daily life, and Defector said that, they, there's just no free moment. But my students also didn't who are the elite, which makes me think it's, it's the rest of the country. And so your question to uh, the writers, there probably are, but I don't know if, if it's possible to be one in a way. 
it's a job. Yeah, it's a job of hailing the great leader. So you write the great leader poems and things like that. What was interesting, though, in North Korea, the English literature that they mention are only two. So one is um, Sidney Sheldon. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> that was the only writer they know, Sidney Sheldon. And the other, they'll say, oh, I know an American, you know, English writer of the English language. And they say Sidney Sheldon. And another writer is um, Margaret Mitchell. Margaret Mitchell, Gone with the Wind which is about North and South, and North winds. <laughs> but they call it the disappeared with the wind. And yeah, that's the only, only book they all say, North winds. <laughs> this is a strange question, but why were the students learning English? Like what if their mind was the purpose of them learning English? What were they going to do with it? You know, that was a th something I battled there because they would ask me always, they would say, how do I learn English better? How do I speak it better? And I would think, but when would they use it? They're not allowed to leave the country. But like our minder, for example, was a graduate of Kim Il-sung University. Kim Il-sung University in North Korea is like Harvard. And he majored in English literature, he said. So, I mean, I know he did. I don't know. I think it was like English language and literature. But he, that's the job he got. You know, probably this, 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 in, his English was fluent from the best university in North Korea. The job was to be our minder and taking us to the grocery store and watch us and communicate with us in English. So I don't know what kind of, uh, I thought, but I thought it was hopeful in that they wanted their elite youth to learn English and perfect, and they spoke it really well. So, um, which meant that they felt the need to learn English for their um, governing body, clearly. So the future leaders of North Korea are all going to be fluent. They were fluent. They were just such good students, you know? So if you study something eight hours a day, you are gonna be fluent pretty soon. All right, listen, thank you very much, Suki. This was a great conversation. <laughs>